<laughs> some people hate winter, some people love it. And whether you love snow or hate snow, you're still gonna have as much snow in your life. But Kathy and I have come up here to Algonquin Park for a week of winter camping. And uh, I thought it was an ideal time to talk a wee bit about the history of the Algonquin people who for uh, 8,000 years before Europeans landed on this continent, this was what they called home. And it's a fascinating history. I'm gonna take you on a little trek and show you some uh, different parts of the park while we're up here. Uh, yeah, and I think you're gonna enjoy it. Kathy scarf she knitted me is serving me well, but that bit didn't quite collect that bunch of snow. Anyway, in our woodland escape, we tend to focus on our uh, persona, which is that of the mid 1700s, but we're stepping back 8,500 years ago for this little episode. Uh, it's interesting um, about winter camping. I remember I started win winter camping when I was, I don't know, 16 or 17. And it was late fall and I was way up north at Coldwater Provincial Park. And there was hardly anybody in the camp and I think the park warden was bored. So he struck up a conversation with me. And uh, I'm telling him how proud I was that I go winter camping up north. And he says, oh, where do you go? And I said, Algonquin Park. And he said, oh, no, you darn fool. He said, that ain't up north. He said, this is out north. And as the years went on and I did camp that far north, I found out exactly what he meant. So. Algonquin Park, uh, sort of the difference between about minus 20 nights and Coldwater Provincial Park, sort of minus 40 nights. Anyway. So in the area I'm standing, it's, uh, it's called the Ottawa Valley or the St. Lawrence Valley to the south of us, but I'm uh, kind of looking south at this point. If we think about the different tribes around us, to the, to the south and west, we would have the Huron. Uh, to the west and north, we would have the Ojibwe. To the north behind me, we would have the Cree. Uh, to the uh, east, we would have the Montanaes. And to the south, south of the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence Valley or in river, we would have the uh, five nations of the Iroquois at the start of the history I'm about to talk about. Uh, ultimately, that becomes Six Nations. Uh, so what we have here is the, is, is the linguistic Al Algonquin group, and it's quite large. So it includes all the tribes I just mentioned, with the exception of the Iroquois. They have a different dialect. But it also includes the uh, Malasite, the Abenaki, the Mi'kmaq, and even as far west as the Blackfoot are all the same basic root language or Algonquin linguistic group. So anyway, a little further into the bush. Oh, while I mention it, these, this contraption I'm wearing, we can attribute those to the Algonquin people. And in fact, this one is in fact, um, Algonquin style. And I think they're close to a hundred years old. One of my pride possessions. Um, yeah, and they, they, they're better than modern traditional ones, and I like them better than the real modern ones as well. They, they've served me well for years. Oh, and while I'm at it, I mean, the natives gifted us a lot of things. Obviously the snowshoes, uh, the birch bark canoe, but of the birch bark canoes, all the woodland tribes built them. To the further north we go, the Cree, back over my shoulder, they didn't have big enough birch, so they built them out of black spruce bark. And to the south, the Iroquois made really crude ones out of elm bark. But of all the tribes that built birch bark, the ones that are credited with having the best craft are the Algonquin people. Yeah, and uh, yeah, Kathy and I have tried to uh, <laughs> tried to build such a craft. We've built a number of them. We've yet to reach that perfection that the Algonquin people did. We got a long way to go before we ever build one equivalent to what they would have built hundreds of years ago.
the um, the origins of the word Algonquin um, may be lost to history. However, there is a Malasite word um, for Algonquin, meaning um, the gathering of relatives. Um, and that's probably about as close as we can get to it. There's another Ojibwe one, meaning people who spear fish from the bow of canoes or something like that. But we really don't know the origins, but um, they were a, a powerful nation. They were a nation that encompassed a huge track of, of land um, and uh, with a fascinating and a sad history. And I'm gonna get into the sad part because that starts just as soon as Europeans land on in the new world. And uh, it's all gonna go downhill from there for, for the Algonquin people. So when Samuel D. Champlain first makes contact with the Algonquin peoples, um, we're, we're talking 1603, and, and then he's back to France. And then on his return trip, 1608, he realizes the importance of the trade with the Algonquin people for their furs. So, and he's a businessman, so he moves his fur trading outpost further upstream to make it more convenient for them, uh, to bring their furs in. It's a closer distance for them. And that works very well, but Champlain is extremely anxious or keen to make treaty with both the uh, Algonquin people and their allies, the Montanais. Uh, and, he, and he realizes that, uh, that if he can make that treaty, that he'll lim eliminate um, his European rivals, primarily the Dutch and the English, from this lucrative fur trade. Uh, however, he's got a wee bit of a problem because the enemy of the Algonquin, the Montanais and the Huron, is this five nations people south of the, the Great Lakes called the, uh, we have the, the Mohawk, the uh, Oneida, the Onondaga, the Seneca, or the Cuga and the Seneca. And a few years later, the Tuscarora making it the Six Nations. And they are desperate enemies of, of the Algonquin people. And when Champlain finally does treaty with them, uh, he makes an enemy of the French and the Mohawk, or I should say the Iroquois, Five Nation people, uh, for a hundred plus years, 180 years or so, they're going to be enemies. And d down the road, that's not going to work out so well for the French. I just cut my first moose tracks. So Kathy and I have come up here hoping that we're gonna, we're gonna actually see and film moose and uh, they're not overly fresh, but at least they're tracks. So yeah, there's moose hair in the park. Um, and that reminds me too, that the Algonquin people were not agrarian. Um, they were hunter gatherers. So we're talking an era, um, we know historically the winters were much harsher. Um, uh, starvation was quite not uncommon for these people. And, and oh, there's not a lot of tracks out here. I just, it's hard to sort of wrap your head around trying to survive, but they did survive and they thrived. Uh, anyway, we're back to uh, Champlain. So he wants this treaty and he finally gets it signed in, in 1614. And, and the reason he, he, um, he has to sign it under a condition that he will help the Huron, the Montanais and the uh, Algonquin people fight their dreaded enemies, the Iroquois. And uh, a year later, he does just that. He joins a group of them that make a raid down to some Oneida and Onondaga villages. And uh, they kill a few Iroquois, they shoot them all off. First time some of these Iroquois have ever seen a, a muzzle loading gun. Uh, they're using firelocks at the time, but uh, that, that seals the deal, if you would, for almost a 200 year period of the Iroquois hatred for the French. So we've, we think, uh, we know what's coming up now is the Iroquois and, and, and their reputation for being ruthless and taking the Huron and almost wiping out or annihilating the Algonquin people, the Huron people, the Montanais people. But in reality, if we go back in history and time before European contact, the part of the St. Lawrence Valley uh, system and river was traditional land of the Iroquois. And they had never forgotten that. They had been forced out by a, 
amalgamation of the Montanais and the Algonquins and forced south of the Great Lakes, but it was something they never forgot and fully intended at some point to attempt to take back. So the Iroquois nation have a problem. They're depleting their beaver. They're all but gone. And they have a trading relationship with the Dutch. And the Dutch are shipping these furs out of what we know today as New York City. Uh, but the Dutch, uh, if, if the Iroquois are to maintain that relationship, that trading relationship with the Dutch, they need new hunting ground, they need new territory, and they start to look north. So we get to 1629 and um, France is at, at war with Britain in Europe and, and the British take um, advantage of this and they attack Quebec and they win. So 1629 to 1631, essentially aside for Spanish holdings in the North American continent, it's all Britain. And I, and I often wonder if they'd not given it up in the Treaty of um, uh, Oh, shucks, I forget the name of the treaty. But had they not given it back to the French three years later, uh, they, uh, what would have happened? Would there ever have been a French and Indian War? How different would the North American continent look like? Would there have been an American Revolution? Would it have been later? Anyway, pure speculation, but a wee bit of fun. Uh, so now the French, after this war, they have, they have their continent or their part of the continent back. They, they try to regain their power along the St. Lawrence, and they do that by arming the natives as much as they can. However, the Algonquin people, um, they, they, they don't think much of the uh, Europeans' uh, religious system. And the French, in, I guess in their stupidity, are only going to give guns to those that have converted through the black robes, the Jesuits, to their religion. So it alienates the Algonquins. The Algonquins move away, which now makes the trade route not as defended as it was. And the uh, Iroquois and the Dutch take advantage of this. Now, the Dutch, in retaliation, they start arming the Mohawks, which eventually arms the entire five nations, uh, five nations with the latest and highest tech firearms of the time period, and as many as they want. So now we have not only the strongest confederation of natives, but they're all armed. And, and then we see, I can sort of cut to the chase here a bit instead of getting into a lot of dates, but we see them pushing the, uh, the Algonquin people off of their to ter uh, territorial grounds. Uh, they see the total, and while they're doing that, the Seneca and um, Cayuga and Onondaga are pushing the Hurons. Essentially, they were wiping almost all of them out. The Algonquin nation ends up, at the end of the day, uh, poorly treated. Uh, they were allies with the British during the French and Indian Wars with Sir William Johnson. Uh, their lands, a lot of them were never ceded in, in our province of Ontario or the Quebec province. Uh, however, they were forced onto eight reserves, as I understand it, one in Ontario and, and seven of them, I believe, in Quebec. Uh, anyway, as I said, a fascinating wee bit of history and a sad bit of history, uh, particularly for these people. Uh, they are making a comeback. Their, uh, their culture and their, there have been some land settlements recently in the last decade or so that have given them back some of this unceded land. So it was a cold, snappy night last night, and um, Kathy and I are modern camping up here in Algonquin Park this time, but my true passion is historic trekking in the winter, and my passion comes from trying to figure out how they did things. So Europeans looked at this vista behind me as wilderness. They looked at it as a place that they needed to survive, that it was life or death, where the indigenous peoples, the Algonquin people who called this home, it was just that, it was home. They, didn't, they weren't thinking of those troublesome things that passed through the minds of us Europeans. And uh, yeah, anyway, uh, it is kind of nice in this cold weather to have modern accoutrements, but it's also pretty neat to go off with a couple of wool blankets, an ax and a knife, and your musket and see what one can do.
As I said, it is a snapping cold day, but one of the reasons the indigenous people this far north were able to live and thrive in this environment was the stuff they built worked. And, and I've had this pair of, they're brain tan moose hide mitts. And I've worn them for 20, maybe 25 years, and I cannot wear them out. Uh, they were done by an elderly Cree woman, and they're famous for their beadwork. And uh, yeah, I just love these these mitts. And Kathy, she knits me up some inner mitts, and they're warm as toast. Anyway, on for more of Algonquin Park. There, there's absolutely no doubt that this is a, a very harsh environment. And um, as Europeans, we all have a fixed place. We build a home, we live in a house. But the hunter-gatherers, they were constantly on the move, constantly had to reconstruct their homes. And if we look at um, some of the indigenous people, like the Huron and the Iroquois, they lived in permanent villages. They were agrarian. They had long houses and palisade walls and... But the Algonquin people that lived in, in this area, they had to move in the winter. Their bigger summer camps couldn't sustain the numbers, so they would take the bark off their dome-shaped wigwams, which they tended to have in the summer. Often the, the bark would only be in the top, and they'd use reed mats that they'd sew from cattails that worked for both ventilation and to keep insects at bay. Anyway, they'd take that bark and they'd head off with their toboggans into this environment, and they would have to reconstruct their home. And they were very efficient at it. The, the wigwams that they built in the winter most often were, were a pyramid shape, like a, we think of a modern teepee a, a, in the Western tribes like the Sioux. And they kept them fairly small. They would shed the snow at the start and then the snow would build up as an insulation. Uh, in the spring, at sugaring time, uh, when the winter hunt was over, they would regather uh, and congregate back at a at a common site with other family groups. Uh, and again, they'd take that bark off if it was reusable, uh, and they'd take that back to their summer camp. Um, some time ago, we did uh, uh, an episode with uh, uh, Caleb Musgrave, uh, and he's a full-blood Ojibwe or Mississauga native, and uh, it was a fascinating look at how the natives made their sugar and uh, if you look at our playlist you can find that it is and a shout out to Caleb because he's a great instructor and it was a fabulous opportunity for Kathy and I to see how they actually did it.